Hello, and welcome to ChipReport.tv. I'm your host, Chris Gamble of Chris Gamble's Analog Life and the Amp Hour Podcast. This is the show for the week of July 22nd, 2012. Chip Report is a cultivated list of the newest release parts delivered via YouTube. Shows will go out roughly once a week. Who do I think you are? I think you might be a professional without much time in your hands. Or maybe you're a hobbyist who has a hard time finding out about new parts. Or a student just looking to learn more about the industry. Regardless of who you are, watch the video, listen to the audio, or even just check out the show notes, and you're bound to find something that'll interest you. Most of all, learn about some new parts and envision how they might fit in your designs. Let's get started. The ads 131 E0X is a newly released part from Texas Instruments. The X refers to the number of channels. There's two, four, six, and eight channel versions available. Some of the top line specs. The input has a three to five volt single-ended analog input range. 2.5 volts, plus or minus, if you're in the bipolar mode. The A to Ds themselves are 24-bit Sigma Deltas and they can go up to 64 kilosamples per second, which is pretty fast for a Sigma Delta. Each A to D also has a programmable gain amplifier in front of it, which has different levels of gain available for seeing even the smallest signals. The chip itself has an internal reference and an internal oscillator. It's an SPI communication input, so you can talk to it over four simple channels from your microcontroller or FPGA. It also has four GPIO lines so you can talk to relays, LEDs, or whatever else is coming out and touching the chip. On the application side, it's pretty clear this is meant for the power market. You can get up to four pairs of voltage and current monitoring simultaneously if you get the 8-channel chip. At 50 and 60 hertz, I'm not sure who needs 64 kilosamples per second. But if you have a dirty power line and you want to monitor the noise, or if you superimpose data on top of the power line, it could be a good chip for you. And of course, if you have other applications outside of power monitoring, it gives you a lot of A to Ds for a pretty cheap price. At 64 kilosamples per second, you're not going to actually get all 24 bits. You'll probably get closer to 14, but you get 8 of them. And since it's a delta sigma, if you slow it down, you actually get more resolution. It's at $6 per 1,000 piece quantity, it really pulls down the price of an A to D in the 8-channel configuration again. It's highly integrated, and it's really good for if you're doing system-level integration. The analog is basically all taken care of for you. All you need is some passives outside for decoupling and filtering. It's a little boring on the analog side, which is something I really like, but if you need to get a design done fast, it could be really good for your design. The big downside of this chip, you need to get out your skillet. It's a 64-pin TQFP, and you're probably not going to be soldering that by hand. Next up is the LTC4364. There's a Dash 1 and a Dash 2 version. Both are by Linear Technology. It's a surge stopper with an ideal diode built in. And really, it's a mashing together of the LTC4364 and the 4359. The first being a surge stopper, the second the ideal diode controller. It's meant for applications where you're really sensitive to an overload, or you have a really big overload that's coming into your circuit. A good example might be a load dump from a car alternator. You can get lots of voltage and lots of current, and you can blow up your circuit boards really fast. The ideal diode refers to the behavior when it clamps, so it's actually a really low drop in the sub-millivolt level. And it can take up to from anywhere from 4 volts up to 80 volts on the input in terms of a surge, so it can really hold off quite a lot of, a lot of input voltage. When the chip is on, it only consumes 750 microamps. And you can adjust how fast it will turn off and how fast it will turn on again. And most importantly, you can t program how fast it, it cools off the chip. So if you have an incident surge and it really heats it up, you can tell it how long to wait until it tries again. Most of all, you don't need a Schottky diode at the input. And that really saves you some headroom for sensitive applications. The packaging is 4x3 DFNs, 16 channel 16 pin msops and 16 channel soics it uses back to back n type transistors for high current applications say plus 1 amp or 1 amp or more 
you might you might have to pay a little bit more for the end channel FETs because you want that gate gate charge to be really low on the FETs and you want to be able to turn the, the FETs on and off quickly so you can protect your circuit. But you probably aren't, aren't going to have trouble paying for the FETs because the chip itself is anywhere from $350 to $5 in 1K quantities. But if you need this kind of protection, you're going to pay. You always pay when you need that kind of protection. Finally, the SSM2519 is from Analog Devices and was recently released. This is a system level chip, a 2 watt class deep audio power amplifier. It runs on 2.5 volt to 5 volt supplies. It has a, sim a simple I squared C interface and you can talk to it from a processor, an FPGA, and it's a really tiny chip. If you don't want to talk to it from a, directly from a chip or a microprocessor or an FPGA, you can talk, you can stream it audio data in standard formats like left justified, right justified, TDM, or PCM, and then you just skip the control completely. With an 8 ohm speaker, it'll deliver audio at up to 90% efficiency. And it's loaded with features like pop suppression and volume control, up to 255 discrete levels. This chip is definitely meant for portable applications, but you're going to see it in the audio quality. The total harmonic distortion kind of heads downhill around 10 kilohertz. So this isn't going to be a class A, and you're probably not going to put this in your home speaker system if you still have one of those. What it will do is save you tons of power and tons of space. Much like other chips coming out these days, this thing is tiny. 1.4 by 1.7 millimeter, 12 ball BGA packaging. But it's really simple. Control it with your I2C interface and hook up the two outputs to your speakers and you're ready to go. That's all for now. All the parts today can, are listed on the chipreport.tv website, especially this episode's page. Leave feedback on any, any of these chips you've seen, especially if you think up non-standard applications. We'd love to know about that. And if you like this video, I'd love it if you give it a thumbs up on YouTube. If you want to see new videos as they come out, subscribe on YouTube and it'll let you know. Until next week, get designing with those new chips. See you then.